going to be a tough act to follow. Thank you so much, Jessica, for sharing your story so openly. So thank you so much. Uh, next up, I have our first physician presenter for the day, Dr. Obi, who's joining us from East Carolina University, will give an overview on sarcoidosis. Thank you, Dr. Obi. Good morning, everybody. I would first like to start by saying a very big thank you to the Foundation for Psychoid Research for the opportunity of being here to speak with you all. I also want to say a very big thank you to all of my patients who have sarcoidosis for the privilege and the honor of letting me take care of them. Certainly the goal at the end of this conference is that we all leave with answers. We may actually end up having more questions than we have answers. But I want to say that my biggest lessons in taking care of sarcoidosis patients have come from my patients. It's those patients who tell me, you have to look more. You have to, you have to do something, Dr. Obi. I don't feel well. I know you say my chest x-ray looks good, but I don't feel well. So thank you very much. Uh, I have no disclosures. I will tell you that I am working on a uh, sarcoid registry at ECU. Um, my goal is to have all of our patients in Eastern North Carolina be represented in the sarcoid registry. I think that our patients may behave a little bit differently and my goal is to serve them better by forming the sarcoid registry and working together with FSR so that we can be more represented in sarcoid research. Now, my outline today <coughs> in talking about sarcoidosis is really based around the questions my patients ask me. Anytime I go into a room to tell a patient they have sarcoidosis, inevitably the questions really are the same. They're like, what is sarcoidosis? What causes sarcoidosis? Why me? Who else gets this disease? How does it present? How come it's different in my sister than it is in me? How come my next door neighbor who has sarcoidosis is not as badly affected as me? How, does this, how, how do you make a diagnosis? What are the major treatment um, um, uh, 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 modalities available and will I die from this disease? So I'm going to start with the first question. What is sarcoidosis? And what I tell my patients is it's a chronic systemic granulomatous disease of unknown cause and they look at me like I have two heads. So I say let's break it down. <laughs> let's break it down. What we do know is that for some reason, we're still trying to figure out that reason, the body's immune system goes into hyperdrive and it forms these clusters of immune cells known as granulomas that can deposit anywhere in the body, head to toe, the head, the brain, the eyes, but the lungs seem to be affected in most patients. Now, we don't know why the immune system behaves the way it does in sarcoidosis, we think it has to do with what we call a gene environment interaction. So essentially, your genetic makeup determines how your body reacts to certain uh, antigens or substances in the environment and drives the way the, the, the immune system behaves in sarcoidosis. Now I tell folks, it kind of behaves like a response to an infection, but we've done studies and there's really no particular infection. When we say it behaves like an infection, what it means is essentially the immune system is the, the system in our body that helps us fight infections. There are two major types of immune cells that are involved in sarcoidosis. They are called the T cells, which are specialized immune cells, and the macrophages. Now in people who don't have sarcoid or the way the immune system was designed, these two groups of cells really should work together to help us fight infections. And after the infection is contained, <clears throat> the immune system should switch off. Now in patients who have sarcoidosis, for some reason, their immune system doesn't switch off. It goes into hyperdrive. So that when there's an exposure to something in the environment, these two cells work together to produce special chemicals known as cytokines that drive the process and of course the formation, the growth, the multiplication of what, of what we call these granulomas. Um, these granulomas typically we think maybe form in the lungs but can affect, like I said, any part of the body. Now, the disease process or the symptoms that you have in sarcoidosis really are dependent on where these granulomas deposit. So if you have a lot of granulomas depositing in the lung, you may present with lung symptoms. If you have a lot of granulo granulomas you know, present in the brain, you present with symptoms related to the brain. 
Um, but the immune process itself can also cause symptoms. So a lot of patients present with things like fatigue, they just feel, you know, depressed, just diffuse aches and pains. We think that's a result of the immune system itself being revved up. This is a picture <coughs> of a sarcoid granuloma. At the bottom right, yeah, that works. At the bottom right is a biopsy from a lymph node. And we can kind of see all of these pale spots, these huge clusters right there. This lymph node is packed with these granulomas. At the bottom, at the top, uh, the top, I guess, to your right picture, to the, to the left right here, is a close-up of one of the granulomas. And you can see that it is a tightly packed structure. The center or the core of the granuloma is made up of what we call epithelioid cells. Those are special type of macrophages. And then you have when these macrophages all blend together, they form giant cells. And they are all surrounded by these T cells, special type of cells um, that I talked about earlier. Now, one important thing to note is sarcoidosis is not the only thing that causes granulomas or that causes a granulomatous inflammation in the body. A lot of other things can. And part of our job when we make a diagnosis of sarcoidosis is to make sure that we've excluded all those other things that can also cause a granulomatous inflammation. Things like TB can cause a granulomatous inflammation. Now, for most patients <coughs> who develop these granulomas, so the sarcoidosis, the most patients actually resolve or go into remission. Um, studies have shown, uh, some of the studies that have shown that about 50% of patients would actually resolve within three to five years. At the end of a decade, about two-thirds of patients um, would have complete resolution of their symptoms. <clears throat> At the end of a decade, about two-thirds of patients would have complete resolution of their symptoms. But for reasons that we don't fully understand yet, again, kind of going back to this gene environment uh, process, interaction I talked about, a third of patients will have a progressive, debilitating, fibrotic disease with destruction of whatever organ is affected. Those are the ones that tend to present with you know, more symptoms, more higher morbidity, and um, tend to overall just do poorly. In terms of mortality, the death rate in sarcoidosis is generally low, somewhere about less than 5%. <clears throat> now, I talked about the gene-environment interaction uh, earlier on, and I'm just going to kind of expand some more on it and give you the data that we know so far that makes us uh, believe that sarcoidosis has to do with the gene-environment uh, um, pro interactive process. What we do know is sarcoidosis clusters in families. Now, this is a study um, that was done in the late 1990s, the ACCESS trial. Uh, ACCESS stands for a case control etiologic study of sarcoidosis. So what they did was <clears throat> they got about 700 patients who had sarcoidosis, and they matched them with another 700, about 700, and you know, overall 706 patients who didn't have sarcoidosis, matched them for like age, gender, ethnic group, you know, living in around the same areas. And what they did was, you know, talk to these groups of patients to find out what, way, what have they been exposed to, what are the risk factors, who in their family has uh, sarcoidosis. And what they found was sarcoidosis clusters in families. It was shown that uh, patients or cases who have sarcoidosis are about five times more likely to report that their siblings have sarcoidosis and about two to three times more likely to report that their parents had sarcoidosis. Now, anytime I tell patients this, the next question they ask me is, what should I do? Should I talk to my family? Should they start getting screened? Um, what about my children? Is this directly uh, heritable? And the answer is no. There's really no screening process available for sarcoidosis and there's really, sorry, there's no indication for the screening process. 
The reason being that overall it's just very, very few people that are affected in the honor order of about 1-2%. to 2 So there's really no reason for screening. There's no benefit to screening. And more importantly, more recent studies have shown that the genetic component of sarcoidosis really accounts for less than about 40 to less than 50% of the disease process. Other information that supports the genetic component of environment is the fact that through genome studies, we have identified several genes that are more commonly found in patients that have sarcoidosis. Now, talking about the environmental exposures, this same study, the ACCESS study, <coughs> looking at cases and controls who had sarcoidosis, found out that patients who had sarcoidosis were more likely to report occupational exposures to insecticides, they were more likely to have worked in moldy or musty environments, they were more likely to have worked handling birds, working in like cotton gin in factory. We tend to see where sarcoidosis clusters in certain occupations like in the US Navy, in metal workers, in firefighters, there's a cohort out of the World Trade Center first responders that have shown that those um, first responders are developing sarcoidosis at a much higher rate than the rest of the New York population. Um, you know, people who handle building supplies and work in the auto manufacturing industry. This is a table <coughs> that really kind of summarizes the work exposures or the work types that are associated with sarcoidosis at the top and those that are not. The bottom line, really, the take home of this slide is the fact that it is not one single predominant environmental exposure. We think it's multiple exposures that uh, predispose or increase the risk of developing sarcoidosis. Now, more recently, we're starting to also think that it's possible that obesity may also play a role in sarcoidosis. Now, the reason I say that is currently, um, over the last few years, we actually, I should say, have an obesity epidemic here in the U.S. Now, what that will do for sarcoidosis in terms of incidents and numbers of patients that have sarcoidosis, we don't know. Um, we have this information about obesity increasing the risk of sarcoidosis out of two studies. The Black Women's Study is a huge longitudinal study looking at about 59,000 black women spread all over the United States, looking to see those uh, diseases that affect African Americans. Um, <clears throat> that study showed between 1995, over a 16 year period, to about 2011, having a BMI greater than 30 was associated 40 with increased risk of sarcoidosis by up to 40%. A similar study looking at um, nurses in the US, also dating back around that time from about the 1980s up until now, the nurses health study uh, is actually predominantly Caucasian study, about 98% Caucasian based. That study also showed that obesity is associated in some, um, some cases with up to a 70% increased risk of developing sarcoidosis. Now obesity is a problem, it's something we can do something about and that's why I mentioned that here. All right, I'm going to switch gears some and talk about <coughs> who gets sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis is a worldwide disease. It affects people of all racial and ethnic groups. Now, we think of what we know so far is the people that are mostly affected are the Northern Europeans and African Americans. I tell my patient it affects kind of like the super white and the super dark. <laughs> here in the US, here in the US, it affects African Americans about three times as much as it affects Caucasians. And in all ethnic groups, it affects females much more than males, about one and a half times more than males. We used to think that sarcoidosis was a disease of young adults mostly people between the age of 20 and 40, but based on recent studies, which I'll show you in my next slide, that uh, belief has actually changed. We now think that sarcoidosis affects patients all the way from maybe their mid-30s or 40s up to their 60s. We currently think that here in the US, between 150 to 200,000 people live with sarcoidosis, but within the sarcoidosis community, I think we all realize that that is an underestimate. 
The reason being sarcoidosis presents in so many different ways. There are people who have no symptoms at all, and it's really almost impossible to count the number of patients who have the disease at any given time. Now, <coughs> this is a big slide. Uh, forgive my voice, please. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> this is a busy slide, but this provides uh, information um, about kind of what I talked to you in the other slide. I'm a very visual person, and my patients have kind of, I've come to appreciate that my patients appreciate a whole lot more when I show them pictures. So on the left-hand side, on my, I guess on your right-hand side, this is a study from the 1990s that kind of looked at the epidemiology of sarcoidosis or who gets sarcoidosis. And on the other side is more recent study from which we have more recent information. Now, uh, in the, oh, in, sorry, let's see if I can make this happen. All right, now on the left hand side, this study was based out of Detroit. We had a HMO that was associated with a Henry Ford a Hospital. They looked at new cases of sarcoidosis over a five year period. And what they showed is that the highest incidence of sarcoidosis was in African Americans, with the highest incidence being in African American women here, and then lower incidence is here in the Caucasians. This is a more recent study from the Optimum Database done by Dr. Boffman and his group. The Optimum Database is a health insurance database to which about 15% of the U.S. population subscribe. That study also showed, very similar to what the previous study showed, that the highest incidence of sarcoidosis is in African Americans and the highest prevalence, again, in the same, in the same uh, ethnic group. Incidence means the number of new cases. Prevalence means the number of patients who currently have the disease. And they also broke it down by uh, gender, and they found that the highest uh, incidence was in African American women. This study, in addition, also showed that uh, Asians and um, Hispanics overall have lower incidences of sarcoidosis. Now, at the bottom of the slide is the study that kind of suggested that the highest uh, incidence um, in terms of age was in the young adults. Um, more recent studies have shown, as you can see right here, that the incidence is really fairly equally distributed between patients who are all the way from 45 all the way to 65 and older. <coughs> in terms of geographic distribution, what has been shown in all the studies is that the lowest incidence and prevalence of sarcoidosis is in the western part of the country. The highest incidence is here in the Northeast as well and in the Southeast regions. All right, how does sarcoidosis present? I'm going to go over several slides. These are pictures and uh, taken from my patients. Uh, slides of you know CAT scans, MRIs from my patients. All right, now um, there are three major ways sarcoidosis presents. Is what I tell my folks. The first group of patients are. Those who have completely no symptoms whatsoever. So this would be one of my patients who presented to me because she had an abnormal chest x-ray. Um, she's been a teacher for 30, 30 plus years, was retiring from the teaching industry, and she wanted to volunteer in the hospital. And uh, I think for some reason, I really don't remember what she was asked to get a chest x-ray, and the chest x-ray was suggestive of sarcoidosis. And uh, all through her life, and I've been following her now for about four years, she's completely been asymptomatic. So that's one group of patients. Now you have the second group of patients who present with what I call this parasarcoid syndromes, like fatigue, just tiredness, chronic pain. And then you have the last group of patients who present with organ-specific symptoms, depending on the organ that's affected. This is a patient who presented with sarcoidosis affecting her lungs. She came in with cough, shortness of breath, just pain, chest pain in the middle of her chest. And this is her CAT scan showing significant involvement in sarcoidosis. Sarcoid affects the skin. This is really is the same patient who presented with these tiny bumps you can see in the corners of her eyes. Um, this is another patient also with skin sarcoid who presented with these scarring lesions on his forehead and these huge lumps on her hands. 
And for some reason, again, I think it has to do with genetics. Skin sarcoid is common in African Americans. Sarcoid can affect the eyes. This is a young lady who came to me with swelling and bulging of her left eye. When we did a CAT scan, we saw where the sarcoid had kind of invaded her eye socket right there and caused that eye to bulge out. After treatment, you can see where it's much better. She also had sarcoid in one of her uh, salivary glands in her parotid gland. Uh, this is sarcoid affecting the heart. You can see the picture up here of a PET scan um, where it lights up right there. Sarcoid can affect the heart in many ways. It can cause the heart to beat, beat in an abnormal way. Uh, it can cause heart failure. It can cause sudden death. This patient had what we call pulmonary hypertension where the pressures in the right side of the heart are much higher. This is one of my patients who came in with a lot of nausea, vomiting, belly pain. And you can see where there's sarcoid in her liver. Her liver is about almost uh, eight times the size of a normal liver. This is her, uh, I mean, I should say her spleen, rather. It's about eight times the size of a normal spleen. This is the spleen after we treated it. This is the MRI of her spleen, just showing all the sarcoid granulomas right there. This is my patient that presented with seizures. And you can see where there's sarcoid in uh, his brain. This uh, gentleman presented with sudden weakness kind of like uh, Jessica presented of his hands and his legs. And this is sarcoid in his uh, spine. Um, this is a patient who presented with abnormal swelling of uh, her arm. And this is one of my patients who has just a lot of fatigue. And you can see where there's a lot of sarcoid granulomas in his bone marrow. He was also very anemic. Um, making a diagnosis of sarcoid I talked to you about, the most important thing is to make sure we exclude all other causes of this granulomatous uh, inflammation. The two big reasons to treat sarcoid would be if it is affecting your quality of life or if it's affecting what I call the life-threatening organ. So sarcoid in the eyes, in the heart, or the brain, we treat. Um, now, in terms of who dies from sarcoid, you know, the highest death rate is really among African-American women. We think in the last 16 years, between 1999 to 2016, overall death rate in sarcoid has remained fairly stable. It's increasing in some populations, particularly in Caucasian women, uh, but overall it's less than 5%. Um, in terms of who dies from sarcoid or what we call high-risk sarcoid, it has to do with advanced age. Um, patients who have sarcoid involved in the heart, patients who have this scarring sarcoid in their lungs tend to overall do worse. And with that, I would like to say thank you very much. He's got a tough job giving you a full overview in 20 minutes. Thank you, Dr. Obi. Uh, next up, uh, we have Dr. Obi's colleague, also from East Carolina University, uh, Dr. Madhapati, who will give a overview on pulmonary hypertension. Thank you. Hello, and good morning. Good morning. My name is Dr. Madhapati. I'm from 